Welcome, Dr. Mark Allen, professor and author, Pepperdine, Graziato Business School, presenting The Hard Truth About Retention. Are you willing to do what it takes to retain your best employees? We've got some serious stuff to talk about today, but we're going to have some fun also. Uh, I'm going to ask you to join me. I'm going to ask you a few questions. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand or shout out answers. As a matter of fact, we're even going to start with a joke. Uh, it's an old joke, and it's not even a very funny one, but it will prove to be relevant. Then we're going to talk about managers for a little bit. And finally, we're going to get into the meat of it, which is what causes turnover. And once we know the drivers of turnover, we're going to talk about the drivers of retention. And then we're going to end with what you can actually do. And to compensate you for the old joke at the beginning, I'm going to end with two good jokes. And we know they're good jokes because they're about HR. So, oh, let's start with the old joke first. Um, a guy goes to the doctor and says, doctor, it hurts when I do this. And the doctor says, don't do that. Old joke, going to prove to be very relevant to what we're talking about. So managers, when I say managers, I'm talking about people who manage people, not just people who have the title of manager, but people who manage other people. And so here's my first question for you. In your organization, do you have bad managers? Please raise your hand if you have, pe everybody's hand is up. So we have people whose job it is to manage people and they're not good at it. And here's my follow-up question. Why? Why do you have people doing a job that they're not good at? And you know they're not good. Your hand was up before I even finished asking the question. So somebody tell me, why do you have bad managers? You didn't train them, okay? Because we put people in jobs that they're ill-equipped for and we don't even train them to do it because that's a thing. They haven't adapted to the time, times change. They need to learn more leadership skills. We put them in the job. So why did we put them in the job? <laughs> they're poor listeners. Why did we put them in the job in the first place if they're bad leaders and poor listeners and can't adapt? Because what? The technical knowledge. They were good at doing something, so we put them in charge of the people who do the thing. Now, I want you to think for 10 seconds about this question. If somebody's the best, it's like the best engineer, the best accountant, the best nurse, Spend 10 seconds thinking about, are they likely to be the best person to manage those people? Everybody's shaking your head. You didn't use 90% of the 10 seconds I allocated for the question. There's no logic that says somebody who's the best at doing something is going to be the best at managing the people who do the thing. And yet, how many of your organizations put people in charge of managing people because they were good at the thing? Okay. Bad idea. Next question. We know why we put them there in the first place. And then we put them there, and they're not good at it. Next question. Why are they still in that position? You know they're not good at it. As a matter of fact, when I said, do you have bad men, and you raised your, you were thinking of specific people, weren't you? You have people doing a job. You know they're bad at the job. Why are they still in that job? Politics. And also, when I say you put them in that job, I don't mean you, HR professionals. I mean your organization. So let's hold on to that thought about how we have bad managers. And let me tell you, I ask this question everywhere I go. And I've worked with a lot of healthcare organizations. And I say, do you have bad managers? And they, oh, yeah, we have bad managers. And then I ask them, do you have bad surgeons? What do they say? Of course not. Of course we don't have bad surgeons. And then I, I had the pleasure a few years ago of working with an airline. I said, do you have bad, yeah, we have bad managers. Do you have bad pilots? It's a silly question, isn't it? Right? Why would you run an airline with bad pi people who are crashing planes all the time? Well, usually not more than once. But do you have surgeons who are hacking up people? No. And if you did have bad surgeons or bad pilots, what would you do? Fire them. When? Immediately. 
But if you have bad managers, what do you do? You show up at a conference and go, yeah, we have bad managers. We need to do something about this. And by the way, why don't we have bad surgeons or bad pilots? They have specialized training, which of course managers don't need because anybody can do that job, right? We're careful about whom we hire as surgeons and pilots. We're not careful about whom we hire or promote to manager jobs. And I know also bad surgeons and bad pilots kill people. And bad manager, well, let's come back to that. So here's the fun part. A lot of my slides are going to have pictures from uh, movies. And I want you to shout out if you can identify the movie. And every time you do, you get a point. And whoever has the most points wins. There's no prize, but you win. So Leonardo DiCaprio dressed as a surgeon. What's the movie? Catch Me If You Can, right. And uh, Peter Graves and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar as pilots, obviously, airplane, roger that. So what drives turnover? The top three drivers of turnover are managers, right? Bad managers or bad relationship between employee and manager. Lack of opportunities for growth and development. Could be for promotions or it could even be for learning. And finally, challenging and interesting work. It's the work itself. And these three top drivers of turnover are enduring. The research has shown this for many. This is not like a recent trend or a pandemic trend. The research has been consistent. These are the top three drivers of turnover. Look what's not on the list. Money. Money, it turns out, is very important in attracting people into an organization. It's not one of the main drivers of whether they stay or go. If you look at exit interview data, you know what the number one reason people give as to why they're leaving? Better opportunity. They're leaving for a better opportunity. But that doesn't really tell you the story. It's not like they were sitting there loving your, their job, loving working for your company, and suddenly a better opportunity showed up. No. The reason they got a better opportunity is because they were seeking a better opportunity. And the reason they were seeking a better opportunity is because there was something they didn't love about working for you. They thought something would be greener on the other side. So even if it is a better opportunity, that means somebody, they felt somebody out there had something to offer them that you didn't. And there's a problem with that because if you look at all turnover, I hate hearing we have 8% turnover, 12% turnover. Those percentages don't tell the story. There are two things you really want to know. Who's leaving, right? If it's a top performer, that's a problem. Do you have some people in your organization, if they leave, that's a tragedy? And do you have some people, if they leave, who cares? And do you have some people, if they leave, <laughs> it's a party, <laughs> we're happy? So the overall percentages don't really tell the story. The other thing is you need to segment your turnover into different categories. And, and the biggest one is avoidable versus unavoidable. What are some examples of unavoidable turnover? De somebody went dark. They went straight to death. Yeah, somebody died. Yes, we can't avoid death. Thanks for the reminder. Death, illness, retirement. Um, family issues, has nothing to do with us as an organization. Better opportunity is avoidable, means they found something better somewhere else. So avoidable turnover means we could have done something potentially to keep them. And so when they found a better opportunity, it's because they were seeking a better opportunity, because they were unhappy with their manager, they didn't find opportunities for growth and development, or the work itself got boring. A bonus driver of turnover is flexibility or lack of flexibility. And one of the things we've learned from the pandemic is people like to work at home. Um, think about the notion of working remotely or flexible hours. If you offered many of your employees more money or more flexibility, which do you think they would take? Flexibility has become a currency that we can negotiate with, both for incoming employees and to retain existing employee, employees. 58% of workers surveyed 
recently said they would consider quitting if they were required to come back to the office full time, 58%. And 64%, and this is recent Sherm research, 64% work remotely most of the time. Somehow we still manage to have a lot of traffic here in Southern California, even though two thirds of our workers are working remotely. And that number is actually bigger when you consider how many jobs cannot have remote work. Manufacturing jobs, hospitality, food service and restaurants, those people have to be there. One of the things we've learned from the pandemic is we can get the job done at home. Does that Zoom picture look familiar? Have you spent maybe too much of your life in meetings like that? And so the most frequently heard questions in 2020 when we first went to Zoom were, can everybody see my screen? And do you know you're on mute? In 2021, we started asking, did you get Pfizer or Moderna? Did you have any side effects? The common questions in 2022, when are you guys going back to the office? And where are you working from today? We don't even know when we talk to people where they are. We don't even care where they are. We can get the work done. So flexibility is important. Let's talk about this thing we've been hearing too much about, the great resignation. It's real. For context, just last year, 47.8 million workers quit their jobs just in the US. If that sounds like a lot, it is. It's 4 million a month. For context, in December of 2021, 4.4 million workers in the US quit their jobs. Pre-pandemic, December of 2019, 3.4 million. So a million more people are quitting their job every month. That is a great resignation. 3% um, of the American workforce quits every month. That is not sustainable. How many of you feel like you have a resignation or a turnover problem? Okay, most hands. Um, this is, um, something happened actually before the pandemic, which is we discovered there were more open jobs in the US than job seekers. More open jobs than job seekers. How come we don't just plug in all the job seekers into the open jobs? Skills, they don't have the right skills. During the pandemic, we had some unemployment. Right now, it's gotten so extreme, there are 1.9 open jobs for every job seeker. 1.9 open jobs for every job seeker. So if you're wondering why you're having trouble filling those open recs, there's more jobs than people looking for jobs. And if you think this is a temporary blip, let's talk about the baby boomers for a minute. I know we talk a lot about the millennials and for years I've been hearing the millennials are invading the workforce and they're lazy and entitled as if there's something in the DNA of people born from the early 80s to 1996 that makes them lazy. They're not all lazy and entitled and they're already in the workforce. The youngest baby boomer or the youngest millennials are now 26. Um, my son was born in 1998 and he called himself a millennial, but then we discovered the Pew Research Organization defined the end year of millennials as 1996. So now my son is a Gen Z, so he's no longer lazy and entitled. <laughs> he's now whatever other false stereotypes you attribute to Gen Z who are now invading our workforce with whatever problems they bring. We talk about these groups a lot. What we don't talk about enough are the baby boomers. You've heard of these people? Fine group. Um, what have you heard about them? Traditional, conservative, establishment, which I think is funny because before we ever called them baby boomers, you know what we called them? Hippies. <laughs> they were the hippies and now somehow they're the establishment. But forget the stereotypes. Look at the demographics. The baby boom is a demographic trend. There was a boom in the number of babies right after World War II, as expected in 1946, right? Soldiers came home in 1945, a lot of babies born in 1946. We know why. What was surprising is that boom lasted for 18 years, from 1946 to 1964. Do you know how many babies were born during the baby boom? 
an average of about four million a year just in the US. What does four million a year look like? Four million a year is 10,000 babies a day in the United States, on average, every day for 18 years. Why is that important? Because they're not babies anymore. The first baby boomers from 1946 all turned 76 this year. It means for 18 years, we're gonna have a boom of people turning 76. And what that means is at whatever age people retire, 60, 65, even 76, we're in the midst of a retirement boom. And what the demographics tell us is for at least the next 18 years, there will be more people in the US exiting the workforce than entering. What movie is this a picture from? Baby Boom, that was an easy one. Hold that thought, more people exiting the workforce than entering. How many of you work for an organization that's planning on growing over the next five years? Growing revenue, right? Does that also mean growing headcount? Where are you gonna find these people? Well, I, I can help. What we wanna do is drive retention. And if you think about it, when I work with organizations doing strategic workforce planning, the first step is to figure out what we're gonna need over the next five years. The next step where people's minds go is, now how are we gonna get them? So they think about talent acquisition. And then after that, they think a little about talent development. We'll buy them and then we'll build them. The first thing you should think about once you know what your talent needs are is retention. Because every good employee you retain is one less you need to hire. Um, Deloitte did the research on this, not for a client, but for themselves. They're obviously a big organization and they discovered if they can reduce unwanted turnover by one percentage point, that will save the company $400 million a year. A reduction in turnover by one percentage point will save $400 million a year. So remember, every good employee you retain is one less you need to hire. So we need to focus on retention. Well, retention is the flip side of turnover. It's so funny when I hear people talk about, we don't know how to drive retention but we know exactly what causes turnover. Get, to drive retention, get rid of turnover factors. So I know it's gonna sound easy, but if the reason people leave is bad managers, you know what drives retention? Good managers. If lack of opportunities for growth and development drives turnover, give them opportunities for growth and development. Give them challenging and interesting work. As a matter of fact, for top performers, public enemy number one is boredom. You can't let your workers get bored. And give them flexibility whenever possible, offer flexibility. So I know it's easy to say give them these things. It's not easy to do it, but it's not easy to run your organization when people are exiting at a mass level and you can't attract people in fast enough and people aren't entering the workforce fast enough. Another easy one, what movie is this? Bad manager, or bad bosses. They actually made a movie about this. Um, it, it was listed as a comedy, I see it as a tragedy. So how can we drive retention? So let me ask you again one more time. Do you have bad managers in your organization? Please raise your left hand. Your other left hand, okay, thank you. Keep your hands up. Do you have bad managers in your organization? Look at your left hand. Dr. Mark says, stop doing that. If your hand is up, your organization deliberately has bad managers. I don't mean you're saying, that guy's bad, let's make him a manager. But you're not saying, that guy will be a good manager, let's promote them. And you're not saying, oh, that guy's a bad manager, let's get rid of him. And so a lot of your turnover is self-inflicted. You're listening to this session probably because you have a turnover problem. Well, the answer exists in your organization. So much of your turnover is self-inflicted. So give them the good stuff. Stop doing the bad stuff. So here are some things you can do. 
look at the bad manager problem and make it not be an HR issue, make it be a money issue. Research for decades has shown the approximate cost of losing a top performer is 1.5 times their annual salary. So that's how Deloitte did the math on their turnover problem. Do the math. Look at how many good people leave your organization every year, add up their salaries, multiply it by 1.5. That's what it's costing your organization. And if you report this to your senior executives, they'll see it as a money problem, not just an HR problem. Another thing, we don't want bad surgeons, bad pilots, because they kill people. The leading cause of workplace stress is bad managers. Workplace stress costs the US $190 billion a year. And workplace stress causes 120,000 deaths a year in the United States, more than kidney disease or Alzheimer's. And I love this quote, according to the Mayo Clinic, your supervisor is more important to your health than your family doctor. It is actually true that bad managers are literally killing people. And this research comes from a book by Jeff Pfeffer, who does research at Stanford on this sort of thing. And so the bad manager problem isn't just something we can live with. And it's amazing, everywhere I go, do you have bad man? Everybody, yes, we have bad man. Like it's a routine, we, we pay our taxes, we do inventory, we have bad managers. It shouldn't be routine, it shouldn't be acceptable. It shouldn't be okay with you to have bad managers. I would be remiss at this point if I didn't remind you that at Pepperdine University, we train people to be good managers. As a matter of fact, we also have a Master of Science in HR program that talks about this stuff specifically. Um, go see my colleague, Sean, at that booth over there. We have an online master's. He'll tell you all about it. Even if you don't want an online master's, go see him. We're having a free conference online next Thursday, and he can give you details. Who's that a picture of? Mandy Moore from what show? This is us. She makes you cry because she has Alzheimer's. <laughs> but bad managers kill more, or at least workplace stress, kills more people than Alzheimer's. So what can we do about this? What actual action items can we take? I've been doing this so long that I remember a time when HR people used to say to me, we deserve a seat at the, we need a seat at the table. You've heard about these seats and these tables? How many of you work for an organization where HR has a seat at the table? Use that seat. If you're the person at that table, convince the executives the bad manager problem is costing us money it's costing us talent. It's costing us productivity. If you're not the person at that seat, tell the person at the seat to make this case. And then ask for HR to be involved in all decisions involved with promoting or, manage or hiring managers. It's that important. We just can't have bad managers. One thing I've seen a lot of organizations do, they use the chief of staff model. And what that means is they take the best engineer and they put them in charge of the whole engineering function. But that person has a chief of staff who, who manages the day-to-day, -day, including the people management. Free up the engineer, the accountant, the nurse to oversee that function, but not deal with people management. And that works. And think about your top performers. Top performers deliver two to four times the value of average employees. I'm not talking about the spread from your worst employee to your best. If you look at your good meets expectations employees, your stars deliver double, triple, or quadruple the value. What would you do to retain someone like that? The correct answer is anything. Because think of what it costs to replace them. And in many cases, you might even be able to replace the body, but you'll never be able to replace that productivity. If I told you pick one person in your organization who's a star you can't lose, and said you have to keep them. Could you find a way to keep them? Because whatever it takes is not gonna cost what it will cost to lose them and replace them. And chances are whatever it takes isn't money. It's challenging and interesting work. It's flexibility. What do they want? We'll talk about how, how to get there. But if you think about top performers, you can find a way to retain them if you focus on them. And that's why there's no such thing as a company-wide retention effort. I worked with a company recently and they did an engagement survey. It wasn't, the results weren't what they wanted. So they decided to put Keurigs and K-cups in every break room. 
That'll drive engagement. Well, that's a nice to have. But how many of you have done exit interviews? You ever hear somebody leave because there weren't enough K, K cups? And, Let's have an annual picnic, we'll rent a park. Anybody ever quit because there weren't enough picnics? They quit because of bad managers. They quit because of lack of opportunity. And also consider your policies around flexibility. I was teaching an executive class in New York a couple of years ago, and a guy, financial serve, Wall Street firm, says, we have this great policy. Every summer on Friday, we let people go at 3 o'clock. Now, they have to have worked 40 hours, so they have to have put in the extra hours during the week. But if they do, if they've worked 40 hours, we let them go at 3 o'clock on Fridays. Now, first of all, this whole idea of they've worked 40 hours, we let them go, that's prison talk, right? <laughs> they've done good behavior, they've worked their 40, we give them early release. Right? I said, do people like it? They said they love it. I said, okay, if they love it, why do we only do it one season out of the year, right? People have worked 40 hours and you let them go. Why not, why can't they do that in the springtime? And is this a great policy when people have worked 40 hours, they can go home? We need to be a little bit better than that about flexibility. So the bottom line here, happy employees don't leave. To oversimplify, keep your employees happy. How do you know what makes them happy? Ask them. The single best retention tool is something called a stay interview. How many of you are familiar with exit interviews? Exit interviews are great. You ask all the right questions at precisely the wrong moment. Right? Why are you asking them these questions at their exit interview? What are you trying to find out? Why they left? So that you can talk them into staying? No, it's too late. And even though we find out why they left, the real purpose of exit interviews is to change our policies so that other people don't leave for the same reason. Honesty time. How many of you work for an organization that uses the data from exit interviews to make meaningful changes to prevent further turnover? I see about six and a half hands in a big room. Here's the problem with exit interviews. It's too late. Stay interviews ask all the same questions before it's too late, and in the present tense instead of the past tense. How many of you have ever gone to the doctor when you're perfectly healthy for a checkup? A stay interview is a checkup. An exit interview is an autopsy. Why do we do autopsies on dead people? Well, you have to do it on dead people because living people scream too much. Why do we do autopsies? To find out why they died. To bring them back to life? <laughs> no. To prevent other people from dying for the same reason. Medical sciences use the data from autopsies to prevent death. We should use the data from exit interviews to prevent further departures. But more importantly, we should go for checkups. How many of you would rather go to your doctor for a checkup than go to your pathologist for an autopsy? Stay interviews or checkups. What does a stay interview look like? A 15 or 20 minute conversation. Take the questions from your exit interview. What do you like about working here? What do you not like about working here? Is there anything we can do to make you happier? Um, there's an interesting book a few years ago that described shoves and tugs. Shoves are the little things you don't like about the job that shove you out the door. Tugs are the things you do like that pull you in. Workers are engaged in a tug of war all the time. What you want to do is maximize the tugs and minimize the shoves. How do you know what they are? A stay interview. Two great things about stay interviews. Number one, they work. They are the single best driver of retention. And number two, they're free. It costs no money. All you need to do is tell your managers once a quarter, twice a year, sit down with your employees. It's not a traditional one-on-one. -on -one. We're not gonna talk about work and projects. We're gonna talk about you. What do you like about the job? What do you not like about the job? What can I do to make your life easier? What would you like to be doing? What could we change? Um, best practice, 
have managers do this every three months. Next quarter, have someone from HR do it. The manager is usually the best person to do it because they can make changes. And sometimes you hear very simple things. I want a better chair. I want to be able to leave earlier when my kid has a game. Um, I love the job. I just don't like sitting next to that person. We can fix that. Next quarter, have someone from HR do it because the person might tell the manager stuff unless the manager says, what do you not like about the job? And their answer is, well, boss, it's you and your stupid face. They won't tell the manager that, but they might just tell someone from HR. Do it quarterly, alternating between manager and HR. It will drive retention like nothing else. You're asking your top performers what will make you happy. And then, if possible, you give it to them. And if it's not possible, you tell them. Don't give them false hope. Make sense? We're supposed to have some questions here, but I'm running out of time, so I'm going to stick around. I'm going to be around all morning if you do have questions. Last chance to earn bonus points. Who's that guy? Horshack, from what show? Welcome back, Cotter. I did promise you two HR jokes at the end. So this guy goes to a job interview. The interviewer says, why did you leave your last position? He says, well, the company relocated, and they didn't tell me where. Other HR joke, guy goes to a job interview. The interview, interviewer says, so, can you tell me about yourself? And the guy says, you know, I'd rather not because I really want this job. <laughs> That's my time, thank you very much.